So this is a five and a quarter inch platter, a hard drive. Uh, this is your three and a half. When Quantum made their drive, their whole point was to be faster than everybody else's drive. And how do you make it faster the simplest way? Where's the fastest location on the platter? The outside edge. So if everybody else has a three and a half inch disc, why don't you just make, because you have a bay, the floppy bay is a five and a quarter bay. There was no three and a half bay. Uh, originally in all of these systems, there was no three and a half inch bay. That was an add-on later on, and that's why they had rails. And they added these rails that you would put in your machine to make a three and a half inch. They were all five and a quarter full height bays because the very first hard drives and the very first floppy drives, IBM designed the very first floppy drives, and Alan Shugart created the very first hard drive. Alan Shugart is the guy who created the floppy drive for IBM. He worked on the team. He was the head physicist at the team. He created the floppy drive. He left IBM. Then he went and created a hard drive. And it's identical. It's almost exactly the same. Not just size-wise, like physically how it functions and operates and the whole thing. He just replaced the floppy with a hard drive. And so he actually made a platter, and that was the first drives that we had, and those for PCs, and that's what you now know as Seagate. Alan Shugart is the guy who started Seagate, so, which I was there for. Uh, so not directly, but indirectly. But in this entire process, that's how come it became that way. I'll show you pictures of that in a second. So this quantum Bigfoot, their idea was, let's use the full bay, Let's make a five and a quarter inch drive, and from five and a quarter to the three and a half, we're faster than everybody else. Once we get to three and a half, we're the same speed as everybody else. But the beginning of your drive, where DOS was, there was no windows, there's no GUI, there's no nothing, seemed faster. So if you're doing something, it actually performed faster. And it made a really cool sound. It sounded like a jet when it was start up. It would go Like it made a really cool sound. Anyway. So that's how that happened, but, uh, but the first drives that were designed were not the five and a quarter inch drives, except for those full height drives. The first drives that we used from an IDE slash whatever standpoint were the three and a half inch drives. So we had already gone through these full height drives from that standpoint. Um, so back to this picture with the IBM drive, you can see that there's a stack of heads, how they're all mounted on there. They still landed and touched the platters to park. For the first... We didn't have heads that parked in ramps or in the center of the drive until like the 90s. Before, before the 90s, in the 80s, we had a floppy disk that we would carry around that had the word park on it. Somebody figured out that there was a trick that if you executed the command, you could move the heads to the last cylinder on the drive and you could park your heads there. There was no ramp, there was nowhere to move it. So if you wanted to move computers, you wanted to park them in the last cylinder because the last cylinder is the least likely to have data in it. Does that make sense to everybody? The last cylinders on most hard drives back in the 80s were called manufacturer test zones. So they would use that one because it was closest to the motor. And when the motor would power on, eventually the motor creates enough of an electromagnet to change the bits that are around the center of that. So they would only write test information there. So if you parked your head there, it was more likely that you would have a drive that would survive when you moved it. So you actually had to park your heads. And so they used a trick similar to when I say I want to go to LBA zero and then I go to the last sector on the drive, I can actually tell it what to do. They did exactly the same thing. They made a command that just said, what size of your drive, what's your last cylinder, pulled it from the bias, set the head there. Done. So, uh, so this drive that I'm showing you a picture of is a Seagate hard drive. It's from 1989. The heads were actually kind of still touching the platter. The piece is too heavy to move. Seagate made a head that sat on the platter, and you can see it in the tracks. In the tracks, it's scratched. You can see them. The data is here, but this here is damaged, and that piece is damaged, and that piece is damaged. Those are scratches. But the data is still fine. This drive still operates today, other than the fact that I've opened it. Um, so, but it still physically functions. And it is one of the last of its kind. Uh, Seagate still was a little behind in switching their motor technology to something called a voice coil magnet instead of using uh, an actual servo-based motor. 
And so I'll show you what that means again in a minute. But uh, in 1989, this is one of the last drives Seagate ever made before they switched to the new voice coil technology that was created by Connor Peripherals, which is probably why they didn't want to switch to it. Apparently the guy who ran Connor Peripherals and Alan Shugart were having a bitch fight. Like they've been you know, fighting each other for years and competing against each other for years. And it was probably made him his happiest day was when Alan Shugart got to buy Connor Peripherals because they basically were bankrupt. So, uh, so at this point in time, the drive itself, you can see physically how the data could be stored here. Here's your problem. If you're a drive manufacturer and you look at a drive like this, how much material are you losing to storing your data in this process? As an estimate, just what would you think you're losing in the storage of this that a manufacturer would hate? What percentage of the drive do you think is lost to scratches and how data is laid out and how much? It's a little bit higher than that, but yeah, it's worse. They lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 67% of the drive to how tracks are stored, to the damaged locations on the drive, to the layout and organization of the way it works. So they have all this space and they estimate that uh, out of the usable space it would have been from new from day one, they lost 67% of what could possibly be stored on the drive. So you could see where a manufacturer would be like, why can't we fix this problem? So there's always going to be some executive somewhere telling the scientist why he can't do something, right? So he's over there somewhere saying, you better figure this out. We want the next size drive. Why can't we do that? So from here, the next step in the design was to try to figure out, if you're trying to be obvious, how to get this head to be able to store data in those locations without scratching, without losing that, and without treating tracks as they normally are treated. We want to make them smaller and store more data in it and see what we can gain back. Okay, so that would be your next thing. So here's where it, changed, it makes the next change. This right here, see these little dashed lines? So this is the job of a servo writer. So here's the thing. A stepping motor works by applying power in segments. Let me show you what I mean so that you're not caught off guard. I'm just going to jump ahead a couple pictures to this. So before 1986, every hard drive that was made used this technology. This is a stepping motor. So this right here is a stepping motor. A stepping motor is I apply a power and it moves so many so far. So just chunk, chunk, chunk. And you hear it in a floppy drive. Like in a floppy drive, basically you hear kind of what it's doing is taking steps, chunk, 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 chunk. And you can hear it kind of going to the next track. Well, that's what was happening here. This design and this technology is based on the floppy disk drive. So it's using very similar processes. So you have a track, a track, a track, and the way you know where you are is you just apply a voltage, a current to the stepping motor, and it goes one step to the next track. So you reinitialize your drive by going to the farthest inside spot you can. So you reverse the motor as much as possible, and then the head will come back to the outside edge. Then you, from then on, know that you're at track zero. I'm going to go to track one. Apply one current to it, and then it goes one track. So you know where you are all the time. Does that make sense? So your operating system can talk to the drive and say, go to the next track, and it knows and it controls the drive directly. Everybody happy with that conversation? So what you need to do is you need to get rid of that because that whole thing is what's keeping you from using two times the amount that you're storing with data, right? So if you have one third the amount that's where the head is, but you're losing each edge of the track, then you're in the neighborhood, roughly, of what each side of the track is doing. If you lined your tracks correctly, you might only lose a smaller amount with one third, but you're losing data based on your head assembly, right? Does that make sense to everybody? So you want to eliminate this. So but it's important to understand, I know what track I'm on by how much power I applied to the stepping motor. Now, I'm Connor Peripherals. I create something new. What did I create? I created this thing. This is called a voice coil. Now, <coughs> this kind of already existed in the hard drive. Your motor assembly 
is fundamentally exactly the same thing. So you're making an electromagnet is what's happening. So you have a magnet on your motor. In your motor, your motor is a circle. And there's a ring on the outside. And that ring has glued to it a magnet. So there's a magnet right there. On the inside, you do the same thing you do in a car alternator or a uh, um, uh, stator. So uh, motorcycles have stators. So basically you're doing the exact same thing. You have a coil, you wrap the coil around something, and then inside where the magnet is, as you apply a current to the coil, it will then cause the magnets to repel and they will spin. And you do the opposite in a stator, which is basically now something else is spinning, and then you're collecting the output from that and then charging your battery, which is the way an alternator works, right? Fundamentally, basically the same premise. So they took that type of technology, and, and it's a speaker also. A speaker is exactly the same thing. You vibrate a speaker by having a magnet, a coil, and then you vibrate it based on current going to it really fast, and then it's, it makes your noise, okay? So this is the same exact thing. So, but the genius of this is how little they had to add to make this work from a physical standpoint. So we had a head, we had an actuator arm, and this already went down. There already was a ribbon cable and wires that went down to the head assembly. All they had to do now was add on the tail two more wires for the two coil to go around. That's it. So you can apply a positive and negative current, move forward and move backwards. You can inverse it and then it moves back and you do a positive and it moves the other way, right? And the only thing that you needed that you don't have here is you need a magnet on each side. So you need a magnet that can then repel the current. So you put an actual natural magnet on each side. Current hard drives, that's all they currently have in them. And people ask all the time, well, how does it work? It only has a magnet here and here. Like that's how it's working physically as it creates an electromagnet. Now there's a lot of math involved following that. But this is the part that replaces this part. And so it's also really cool to see that here we had nothing and over here we had a lot. And now in a current hard drive today, here we have everything, and over here we have nothing. So basically right here, now what they have is an integrated circuit. And the integrated circuit was supposed to be an integrated circuit. It is no longer an integrated circuit. Most of the time it's just a ribbon cable now and little pins that go out. But there used to be a preamp here because the preamps used to be really big. Now the preamp is a tiny, tiny chip, and now they mount it right there. So now it's gone from where it used to be. But they still, I looked at all the patents, it still calls it an integrated circuit right there. So you get rid of this junk and you put that junk that you need over here. And so a magnet would be added, the end of the actuator arm comes down, you have a coil. This one, if you look at this one, I mean, think about how bad the design is compared to what we would have today. So your, when your actuator arm comes out, what stops it from going past the end of the drive? That screw right there. <laughs> you could literally sit on the outside of your drive, play with the screw, and then this thing would back further out and the head would fly right off. So there's seal, there's not much of a seal here. Look at this. They put a piece of foam right there and then they just run their ribbon in. Like they literally just capture it in a lid and put the lid on and screw it on. That's it. So nothing like what we currently do from a standpoint of a safety standpoint as far as our drives go. Uh, but, you know, physically at least, they've gotten rid of a lot of the weight, a lot of the extra stuff that they have inside of a drive. And, and basically the way the stepping motor worked is it had this ribbon that would run down the side of the motor and it would pull the head in and out in a pretty jerky motion uh, and then slide along that. Uh, and they even accounted for it going inside the platter, like it's in between the platter. There's a lot going on here from that standpoint. But we've switched to this now. This is now what we use. And this can go back and forth across the disc at least 60, 60 times per second. So that's a lot in the amount of time that we have. I mean, we're talking milliseconds and microseconds at this point in order for a drive to communicate with the other drive. So with each platter and each head. Uh, so we're gonna break the rest of that down and then I'm gonna show you here. So this was the floppy drive that Alan Shugart created. You'll see that everything around the floppy drive looks basically the same when you get to the hard drive. But 
the way the floppy drive worked is they had a head and it was on a spindle, almost like a screw, with a, um, a spring inside just to keep it aligned. And what would happen is you put your floppy disk in, you close the lid, the head would move out. Uh, it, you first hear it go clunk, 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 and then it would move out after that. The reason it did clunk, 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 clunk is that if you had 17 tracks on a floppy disk, it doesn't know where the head is. So in order to, when you flip the little lever down, it has to reset it back to its original location. Well, if it's eight tracks in, then it has to move it back 17 tracks. So for eight of them, you hear nothing. And then for the last seven, you hear chunk, 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 chunk. So you'll hear the chunk. If it's at the 15th track, you only hear chunk, chunk. So wherever you would do it, sometimes it would be louder than it would have been otherwise because of where the head was when you opened the lever and you pulled the floppy disk out, which people did at any point in time that they wanted. They just flipped it, it pulled the head up like the record player's needle, and then you could pull, the, pull it out. So he designed, Alan Shugart designed this after the exact same process. You'll see the physical size, everything's the same. But all the intellect for this device was in this card. This is a ST506 card, and this card was the brains of the operation. And so this is where everything initially started out was on the card. And then other manufacturers who wanted to make a hard drive would make their hard drive work with this card. But they had to hack the card in order to make it work with their drive. It did not work directly, correctly with their new hard drive. So they would have you do things like pop off a chip and put a new chip on. Like they would write that, send it to you. There was all kinds of compatibility problems. Two drives didn't work together. There was no slave and master and uh, a set of drives. Like making two drives work together was near impossible. And these are $3,000 drives. So people didn't want to waste anything. If they bought a new drive, they wanted to use the whole new drive and the old drive. So we run into a scenario where we start to have a problem. And that is when we started designing ide hard drives. Now, IDE is the Innovated, Innov, um, Integrated Device Electronics. So the whole point was, let's get rid of the card, let's make whatever we're connecting it to stupid, and we'll put all the expensive stuff in the drive. So all the card and all the controller and everything else is on the drive. So that's where the intellect is, that's when they became smart. So we started adding a lot of technology into the drive and it becomes really robust from that standpoint. So this is an IDE hard drive. Um, this is the first one that's a three and a half. It's a Rodom. Rodom is the company that made it. And they were a really great company. They were doing really well. And what happened to them was in the UK, there was a sports betting company. Um, they had horses running around tracks. And they need to do kind of the same thing Casino does. They needed accounting, they need computers to track all the bets and all the stuff that was going on. And I call this, um, uh, it's, it's kind of like the IBM way. Uh, so the way that things work is this. If buying hard drives from the company costs you more than the company is worth by the company, that's what happens. So it's cheaper than licensing technology and you remove all the other people who might be competing with you by using that technology because they can no longer buy it. And lots of companies have learned these processes like um, you know, uh, Redbox. Uh, originally, Blockbuster wanted, instead of all their stores, they started making machines. They were actually first. They were kind of before Redbox. They made blue machines. You guys remember the blue machines? They were kind of in the same place. They were like all around all the places where red boxes are that you can go rent a DVD or do whatever. Well, Redbox figured out, well, why don't we just buy the company that makes the Blockbuster machine and then no longer sell them to Blockbuster. And that's what happened. Like literally like as they started, as Blockbuster started to venture out into the commercial market, they bought their machines and they killed them and that stops your production for like a year. By the time you get everything ramped back up again in a big company like that and get it all out the door again, it's too late. Red box took them all over. So the blue boxes disappeared, got wiped off the road, replaced the red box. So, um, and IBM does this a few more other times along the way, but this sports betting company bought the company, then the hard drives no longer made hard drives for anybody else anymore. 
And so you never heard from them again. From then on, they were just, and they probably disposed of them years later when there was no need for any of the stuff. Um, I, have, I have two of these. I have a couple of these in my library. These also had stepping motors. This is a stepping motor down here. Um, and it's an IDE hard drive, so it still worked on an IDE channel, but it used CHS technology, so cylinders, heads, and sectors. So it won't work on current equipment today. I'd have to go back and pull one out of my stash of all the old equipment that actually will work. Um, so, when we got into IDE hard drives and Quantum integrated the card into this, we started having all the technology that was ready for us to get to this spot with the first voice coil. Because now you've got to have an intelligent box. Now here's my question. When you get to a voice coil, you can now move your head all over the hard drive without having your regular tracks. You can now diminish the size of your tracks and all the places that were being eaten up before by that content are now gone. And now your head can move over that area of the track. How much do you think you gain by doing that? How much back would you think that you get by moving your head gradually over and being able to use the tracks that were eaten up before by the head assembly touching it to now. Any idea? So in theory, you should gain back almost somewhere in the neighborhood of 40% of your drive. So it should, you should only be using 20% of your drive for whatever ancillary stuff that you need to store to keep your drive running. But there's a problem with that entire theory. And that's this. If you use a stepping motor, how do you know where it goes to the next track? How does that work? How did I just tell you it worked? Yeah, you apply a voltage or current to it and it moves a certain number of steps. When you move to this and you no longer are using a specific voltage or current to do that, how do you know where your head is on the platter? Because now it just... It's flying really fast over this. How, do you, how would you know? What do you think you can do if you're designing this technology? Map it out. You gotta map it out and print it on the disk. So a servo writer does exactly that. That's exactly this picture I was trying to show here. They've used at least five different technologies now for storing the servo information. So what they did was inside on the IDE drive, they came up with a calculation and they have a way of filtering out the data. You never see it. It's not part of any of the data you would ever see coming from the head. It's done by the electronics prior to data existing. If it sees this, it just maps it out so you don't see it anymore. And you can only see it with an oscilloscope. So if you use an oscilloscope and you hook it up, you can see them. But you can't see it otherwise. So there is data on the platter that they had to use a special writer to write the data. And I call it GPS coordinates of the drive. So basically they wrote GPS data on the drive that says, I am here, I am here, I am here across the entire drive. Okay? So that servo information is feedback. That's what it means. So servo information is feedback from the drive to the head assembly and the board to tell you where you are. So the head reads it, filters it out, relays that to the board. The board calculates how much of a pulse of data we need, a pulse of current we need, to get to the next piece of data that I want to talk to. So it's controlling positive and negative direction and how far it has to go. And there's some really uh, large math equations in there to figure those things out as accurately and as quickly as possible. Okay? So that's why your board has now become a computer. It didn't used to be. This was a very dumb interface. This is what they basically were using and all the work was done here. But now all of that is now squished onto this drive. And then when you get to a uh, a two and a half inch drive which again is very old when you consider how long this technology has happened. That's a two and a half inch drive. This is called a Prairie Tech drive. Again, um, and I have some show and tell for you on this. So this is a box of 40 year old drives or mostly 40 year old drives, right? Or more. So I have, I own three, maybe four of these Prairie Tech drives. They started out at 120 megs. The next one was 240, 
and they gradually went up from there. Now, Prairie Tech was a great company. They were the first one to design this. This is, without this, there was no laptop. There was no, they didn't really call them a laptop. Uh, they were still huge. They would crush your legs. Um, the first combat portable that you had, that was the, it looked like a suitcase and you picked it up and it had like a front that would fall off and then there was a plasma screen. Uh, and then following that, there was the um, Zeos. Zeos was one of the other ones that made their first laptops, which you now know later who got consumed or bought up by Gateway. Um, and then so on and so on from there. But those, those companies all made some of the very first and uh, those old Toshiba laptops that you saw with the ball in it, they were some of the first ones with the ball and they show them, sometimes they're in hacker movies or whatever else, for those of you who are watching hacker movies. Um, so those, that's the first drive. That's what fit in there. And amazingly, again, the ID interface and everything will look identical to what you're still used to seeing on two and a half inch drives. So I'm gonna pass these around so you can see, but this is a piece of history that no longer exists. It's not a common drive. You can't get them. Uh, they're very, very difficult to get. And so this was one of the first ones, and this was a laptop drive. This one, pretty large uh, from a physical standpoint, standard IDE interface that you would still recognize today on laptops that still used PETA interfaces. And then almost immediately they went to the smaller form factor, which is kind of cool and it feels really neat in your hand compared to something like this. But these are what your laptops were running on back in the day to begin with. And so these were made in the 88 time frame, something in there right after 88, 89. So I'll pass these this way and this one this way. And then after that, Seagate and Quantum within two years uh, and Connor all made a duplicate kind of version of that. So here's the Connor and I'll pass these here. And so those are all the original first laptop drives. That's what everything started with to begin with. And you can see from the IDE board all the technology is in there. You can even see, if you look at it for wires, like they, when they would find a bug, they had to hardwire it to fix whatever problem it was. So some of them will have actual wires soldered to the board, like you'll see it on the board where they've physically just soldered two wires in two different locations to fix a patch or a bug. All right, so, <clears throat> so the, these are the first ones that all have uh, voice coil and they have uh, servo information written to them. These are kind of the first of their kind that existed in this process. Prairie Tech had an embezzlement problem and one of the CEOs or something took some money. They ended up getting shut down like almost right away, but they were super popular drives. Uh, there just wasn't enough time to make a lot of them. They were gone within like two years. Um, and then from then on, uh, Quantum, uh, Quantum, Seagate, and Connor were pretty much the leaders during that time frame. Um, Quantum was a offshoot of people from Motorola. So, all right, so from there, now we talk about heads. The 90s were the drives that were the most stable drives probably ever made. In the 90s, we ended up with an AMR head and uh, it's a magneto-resistive head. It stored data. Let me see if I can use this again. 
Okay, so here's the next technology I need to explain in this process because these are all kind of developed at the same one. I mean, imagine within like three or four years, you've got all these things that have to be done in a certain way. They gradually build on each one all the way through. And it's a very slow process compared to what we do today. Uh, but it's kind of amazing that they all kind of came together at the same time. Um, and, you know, keep in mind during the time frame, we didn't have... As far as the PC world goes, it was pretty much uh, nothing until 82, so we had DOS, and DOS pretty much existed until the 90s. Windows was an add-on sitting on top of that, and it pretty much wasn't until Windows 95 came out we had any kind of integration in the process. And, of course, most of you know or believe that um, all of the Windows stuff was all based on the Mac, which isn't exactly true. Uh, so it was all Xerox Parks, actually. Xerox was the one who had everything. And that's where, uh, for the, at least in the first round, that Steve Jobs saw. And so physically, at least during that time frame, we didn't have a Mac until 1985, which for its day compared to what we had with Windows, Windows looked like a clunky toy compared to that. Couldn't even come close. Um, but as far as the development goes, the one thing that the Mac, at least at the time, didn't really have that, that made the PC what it is today was uh, Lotus. Lotus Notes, or Lotus 123 as a spreadsheet. Um, technically, VisiCalc was the first one. VisiCalc was the very first spreadsheet program, and that was written for an Apple. And then uh, Dan Brickland, I think, is the guy who wrote that. And then uh, Lotus becomes kind of the leader on the PC version because they didn't rewrite VisiCalc or any of the other stuff for a PC. So Lotus was the winner. Um, and then they, add, they made a board that added memory into the computer. It was called an extended memory board. And that's how anything ran on Lotus. And that's what made the world what it is as far as the PC goes because without that we wouldn't have had anything. But the real truth is um, IBM never ever expected Microsoft to be the platform for longevity. They hired them as a, as a, as like a fool's errand. They hired them to make something to get them out the door while they built the real thing that they were building that was going to run on it. Because IBM was all about multitasking micros and mainframes and their entire job was to build a new platform to get rid of their terminals and their minis and their, and their mainframe computers at a better cost. So you could see where that would be the great business market that they would want. So what ended up happening, um, so anybody know what the operating system was supposed to be? That Microsoft made their version of DOS to get the machine out the door, but believe it or not, um, IBM was already developing a graphical interface long before the Mac came out. Anybody know what it was supposed to be? OS2. OS2. OS2 was supposed to be the replacement. They had already been working on it since at least 1983. So uh, IBM was going to get a machine out the door while they were developing OS2 and then replace it with a multitasking graphical interface. And OS2 was supposed to be the winner. Does anybody know what OS2's real name is today? It's a trick question. What did the core of OS2 become? BSD. Nope. Mm -mm. As a matter of fact, uh, BSD is based on AT&T Unix 5, distribution 5, and AT&T Unix 5 was, has, is all based on a package all the way to 1969. So it technically is one of the oldest ones. And so Unix as a whole has existed since 1969, which is why Unix time, epic time, begins January 1st, 1970. And so all Unix time is all based on the beginning of what they call computer history, as far as that goes, which would still be today the most applicable operating system that we have that is the oldest of all of them, which Linux isn't really Unix. It's a Minix uh, clone, which has become a emulator replacement of Unix, basically, for all intents and purposes. We'll get into that again, too. But as far as history goes, it's very important because uh, its file system is based on UFS, 
which is the Unix file system, and that eventually makes its way. Do you know what you know what a Mac is today, right? You know what its real name is. You know what Mac, Mac and OS X. What's its real name? What? What? Uh, Darwin is the name of the kernel that they developed for it. But what did it come from? Mac Yes, the next. The next was the recreation of that, which was a variation of BSD in 1985 uh, or 1986. When, so there's a whole history here of how each one of these things come. I actually was there for all the next stuff. I own five next computers. I still have, I have the very first one. I have the cube from 1986. Um, magnesium cube. They made it out of magnesium. So uh, anyway, there's a whole bunch of history in this process. But let's get back to this one, which is IBM and their basic technology. Uh, so OS2 and Microsoft, they work together on OS2 as the next operating system was going, the, not the word next, but the, uh, as it was going to be the replacement and there was a bitch fight. And I'll get into all that later, but Windows is now OS, like OS2, the kernel of OS2 is what Windows is currently running on. So IBM OS2 was the first version that split off was called Windows NT. Anybody know what Windows NT is? What's NT? What's it stand for? New technology. new technology. See, we're scraping some memories, right? But that's what it was called. It was called New Technology because out with the old technology and with the new technology. That was their whole catchphrase. The whole point was we're kicking OS2 to the curb and over this bitch fight that they had, they sent out a letter about their bitch fight. I'm not kidding you at all. Microsoft was developing, their whole claim to fame back in the day was they developed all of the uh, compiled, um, anything that you were doing that's programming languages. So they wrote all the programming languages and Microsoft was one of the biggest developers in that process at the time. And so they wrote the uh, programming language that was being used to compile OS2. And so they sold developer kits and they were pretty expensive. They were like $3,000 in 1990. They were very expensive. And so when IBM and Microsoft had this little bitch fight, which I'll again describe to you in another story later, they sent out a letter to all the developers who had prepaid for the OS2 developer kit and they said, and I've got one, I've got it laminated. Uh, it says in two pages, it says, we are no longer supporting OS2 and I know you paid all this money and we're sorry that you paid all this money, but we are going to develop in the next five years our Windows NT technology and there will be a new developer's kit for Windows NT. And, and keep in mind, this is vaporware is like a real thing back in the day, back then. Like people promised stuff all the time and it never came out as far as computers go. So they promised that we were gonna have this new technology in the next five years and they were gonna release Windows NT and remember, we didn't have Windows 95, so we didn't even have a good graphical interface. In 1990, the Windows interface sucked ass. It was bad. It was so bad. If you saw it today, you until Windows 3 and 3.1, there wasn't even a halfway decent operable interface. There just wasn't. It was all a text graphic looking box. Like you would look at an old calculator from the beginning of time. And so they sent out a promise letter. If you switch to us, then we will, you'll get the developer kit for free when it comes out, which isn't free, it was already $3,000. We won't charge you any more money. Uh, if you opt not to, then we'll give you back a portion of your money. Like it was just a portion of your money. So they sent this letter out, it's a two page letter, and it says OS2 is dead and Windows new technology, yeehaw. And you had to choose to own up to that before it was ever even a thing. And so, and they did this twice. They also did this between 1995 and 2000 when Windows 2000 uh, was on its way out as a new technology, a next technology. Windows 2000 is just a renamed version of Windows. Now they changed some core code in the process, but even today, there's still remnants of H HPFS. is the file system that OS2 used. The file system that OS2 was built on was called 
uh, high performance file system. And the high performance file system was amazing in the day. Um, there is a book on it. It's, uh, there's a red book and it says uh, the making of OS2. And, uh, and again, to give Microsoft props, it was their engineers that did the primary design for the file system for OS2 um, and working with IBM. There's only one difference between the release of Windows NT and the high performance file system, which you now know as NTFS, new technology file system, out with the old, in with the new. Um, they changed uh, sector 17 because it was a single point of failure. Sector 17 on high performance file system, if that sector went bad, then you could not boot your system. And in NT, they changed that so that there was some redundancy so that that sector would no longer be crucial and it would not kill your file system when you booted. So I know it seems like I'm getting off path, but I'm not. These are all important things as we're heading into the file systems because file systems in data recovery are the most important thing in their physical attributes to the drive. So there is a physical relationship to the file systems, to the drives, and you can see them. And you have to know that in the process of doing data recovery to be more exact and accurate. And so as we're heading through all this stuff, until Apple recently released APFS, there was no bootable file system that has been new in over 35 years. 35 years, I'm not joking, 35 years. Uh, DOS was invented in 82. You started with OS2 in 84. Then there was a Macintosh file system that also came out in 84, replaced in 1985 with HP HFS. And HFS remained almost identical exactly from that day until 1997. And so there was nothing else developed for any other operating system or file system because between those two time periods, there was nothing for a 17 or 20 year period of time. Uh, because once HFS came out, Macs lived on that until 1997. Before that happened on PCs, we had DOS and then NTFS, uh, which is OHPFS, which came out in 84. And so from that time forward until um, 2006, so in 1997 there was one change to HFS for Max, and they uh, added in all of the Unix characteristics into the file system and they made HFS Plus, which was still based on the exact same process but had a wrapper around it to include all of the BSD items in it because what happened in 1997? Anybody know what happened in 1997 to Mac, to Apple? Jobs came back. Jobs came back. And when Jobs came back, the reason that Jobs came back was Apple bought Next. Or Next bought Apple, whichever way you want to look at that. Uh, Jobs comes back. He had created the Next in 1985, in 1986, when he left. And... He didn't want to start the whole thing over again, so he used BSD as his base. So, and that wasn't a PC-based file system at that time. It wasn't a PC-based file system until 1993, which no one used. So there's a whole process that happens in that development cycle. I have and I own all of it uh, and still can run it, all of it. But it's, it was pre-compiled in 1993 for an Intel platform. So in 2006, when Apple switches to an Intel-based platform and then they released an Intel-based version of their operating system running on Intel, they had been compiling it for the last 13 or 14 years before they ever got that far. It had already been created for the next file system and they had been doing it already for over 15 years in order to switch it over to an Intel platform in 2006. So it didn't just happen overnight like they made it seem like it had. They'd already been developing it for over a decade. So there's another whole story behind that. But uh, So in this process, we had no new file systems, but one other thing that happened in 2006 was because uh, <clears throat> Microsoft was making the PC phone, which was what it was basically called at the time, the uh, CE, the Windows CE phone, is a slimmed down version of Windows. They needed a new file system that runs on solid state because their phones were dying. Uh, 
And in, in 2006, when this happened, who was the phones? Who was making phones back then? Anybody remember? 2006 even. You had like Nokia making their dumbass phone and Motorola, Motorola Sym Symbolic was or whatever it is was another one. That's it. Uh, and then you had your Palm Pilot which was making a Trio which was an actual pretty functional operating system. Very slim down but most of it wasn't color or anything. It wasn't a real operating system from a standpoint of all the things that you had in the Microsoft phone. The Microsoft phone had real buttons. You could click, you could run software on, you could, if they'd have had an app store you probably would have done pretty well there. Uh, so there's, there was a bunch of things that were happening on that phone. So they thought they were the leader. They were blowing everything away. There was nothing else out there. So in 2006, at the developers conference, they came out with Windows CE with an update to their operating system using XFAT. So XFAT was added in. XFAT is not a bootable file system. So they were going to boot and then run XFAT as their storage. XFAT is still only storage based. There's no bootable file system. It does not boot. And so this is 2006, they release it, and they say in our next version, as we're going to be running on XFAT, our phones will live three to five times longer than they're living now. But what happened in 2007, January of 2007? IPhone. The iPhone came out. And where I was at, when it came out, and the first people touched it, they called it the Jesus phone. <laughs> so it did everything that you wanted to do except run Flash. It was the only thing it wouldn't do. There's also one more thing it would not do, but they did not admit it at the time, would not talk to an exchange server. So that became a very big contentious moment in time. And it did not last very long. Uh, exchange server became, uh, which was a fight for them because Microsoft didn't want to do it. Uh, Microsoft didn't want to give them uh, active sync on the iPhone so they could talk to an exchange server because they thought their phone was going to make it. But by 2008, it was pretty apparent that their phone was not going to make it. Their phone disappeared almost overnight. I'm not kidding. Like literally Windows Phone, they had to start all over again. And so the reason these things are all important is all the file systems tied to the hardware. And I'll, I'll cover the rest of those in a second. There was a reason why I was going to draw a picture here. Oh. All right. So let's get back to the actual technology before we start putting more software on it. So on a hard drive... When you wrote data on the hard drive, and we're talking about 1991, we're talking AMR, and uh, it was a very simple process. Basically, every sector looked like this, and there was a north and a south pole. So basically, you aligned your data across the platter, north or south, and that's how you could read your data. So now as your sector went by a head, so there's a head, and it's reading that data, as this crossed by it going down, it could tell if it was a zero or a one. Basically, that's how it was working. Now, there's way more complex material than this because there's an encoding process and other things that go with this. But basically, when you're looking at it in data, it looks a lot like this. And so that's your highs, your lows, and whether or not you know what you're reading or writing. This process of writing this right here is called longitudinal. So longitudinal, I can't spell worth crap. So that's a longitudinal process. So the way I look at this is longitudinal encoding is the way we normally bury a casket. We lower a casket into the ground and physically at least it's long ways across the horizon and so we are eating up a lot of space on the ground in order to bury a person into the ground. But what if we dug the hole a little bit deeper and we put them in feet first? And then we could put a whole bunch more caskets in. <laughs> so if you can do that, then it becomes perpendicular, which is what we ended up with in 2006. So our transition from longitudinal was almost exactly to the day 50 years. So the very first drives that were longitudinal in 1956 all the way to 2006 were all longitudinal. So during this entire process, all we're doing is doing a simple arrangement of north and south pole. As it goes by the head, it's a lot like a compass reading the content as it scrolls by piece by piece. Yes, no, yes, no. Everybody good so far? That was very simplistic, very easy to repair. Hard drives lived forever. They were awesome. 
that 10 years is the best 10 years of my life as far as hard drives go. I would have never started a data recovery company if we'd have stayed just like that. It would have never happened. So everything lived. It was rare a hard drive went bad. It was so rare, we barely even talked about backups. The only thing you backed up was like servers and stuff like that until the Melissa virus comes along. So Melissa, that was a whole nother... That was a whole nother fiasco and it's really weird because I don't know if you guys know like the whole transition of the Melissa virus was written by accident technically and it was supposed to be like a school project and he was going to see how many machines he could talk to. He thought it was only going to be like a couple and uh, Morris was his name I think. So Morris is the son of like he was like a the government highest like technical expert or something in the government. I don't remember what it was. Secret the uh, if you look up his history or something, you'll see it's uh, one, of the, one of the agencies that was responsible for technology and his son wrote the Melissa virus and he released it at a school connected to a network and then overnight it infected like millions of computers. Like it made its way everywhere. So uh, that's when people started thinking about backups. Backups, that was the day that pretty much catastrophe happens and now people are worried about what's going to happen. So in this process, um, Robert Morris, that was the guy's, the father's name. Uh, so anyway, so the whole point is in the, that this is longitudinal encoded. It's very simple, very easy. Then by the end of the 1990s, it was created in 97. Uh, it was released in 97, but it takes two years for stuff to make its way to market, especially back then. So until 1999, until the middle of 1999, we did not have the next generation of hard drives released. They, so pretty much the entire 90s, we had the same basic layout. There's a process that when you start to write data to a disk, that there is a time that as you increase aerial density, that you have a problem called the super paramagnetic effect. The super paramagnetic effect, and I have this documented later, but it's called the super paramagnetic effect. It is when you try to write to something that is so dense, it switches and flips the bits next to it. So when you write here, that it arbitrarily, by accident, has affected the, the sector next to it. This is a constant problem that they're always racing with on hard drives, and that's when we hit a delimiter, when we get to a spot where we can no longer store data, that we now need new technology to move ahead. So in this case, up until we got to, anybody remember, anybody old enough to remember, at the end of 1999, what was the largest hard drive made? Holy what? Holy crap, is that what you said? Uh, at the end of 1990, at the turn of the century, the largest hard drive that you could buy It's a little bit large. I think about 1.8K. Wow. That would be great. <laughs> we would be much further ahead than we are today. Huh? Is it a 32 meg? Meg? No. Uh, so, well, we were beyond megs at that point. At the end of 1990. 40 gigs. Huh? 40 gigs. So, that's still a little large. Uh, so, in, 19, in the middle of 1990, we started releasing some of the new drives with the new GMR head, giant magneto-resistive head, instead of the AMR head, which was what we previously had lived on. And when we got to GMR, what happened is, instead of looking at this data as it's going by, we now are looking at a more uh, physics-enabled process where we're looking at how the electrons cause the sensitivity of the head to, to go crazy, basically. So instead of seeing something simple like magnetic where it's just going by and we're looking at it, we now get to a spot where we're using um, electrons and we're seeing if we can make them go crazy as they go by from sensitivity. So the largest drive that we had until the mid-1990s was 10 gigs. And when they released a new drive in the middle of the 1990s, we got as large as 20 gigs. That was the largest drive that we had. Uh, so using the new technology in the last half of the year, we got 220 gigs. That was the highest that we were able to do. And that was rare, even at that point in time. SCSIs were some of the first ones to be released. They were 18 gigs. Um, 
And then otherwise, as far as standard IDE drives, what we had prior to that, it was all going to be 10 gigs. So we almost doubled in size within a six month period of time from the largest that we had ever seen. Whereas before that, our growth was very, very small. I mean, it wasn't until 96 that we had eight gigs. So it was a very small stepping stone through that process. And in that process, the way that we looked at drives had to change. We did not use LBA blocks until we got to that spot. We weren't using LBA until we were late in this process. We were still using CHS and some basic other premises. We had four different ways that we accounted for the way data was laid out on disks. And it caused us some problems. Uh, we also had a problem where the largest partition that we could have running on an NT system was four gigs. So we had to trick our systems in order to get past four gigs after 1996. So we didn't even have that big of a drive until we got to the eight gig drive that was in 1996. So we had to come up with some tricks. And then we had another problem that went with that. So, so in this discussion, when we got to the 20 gigs, um, it's all based on this one thing. So there's a guy at IBM who had been working on this case to try to get past the super paramagnetic effect we were about to have on hard drives. We couldn't get past 10 gigs. It was a very slow process. Every time we did something, we added another layer, we did something that would make it a larger drive. Then at that point in time, we still had a problem trying to get past the 10 gig mark. So he had been working for four or five years on the GMR. And the GMR is based on, um, and occasionally there's these two guys that get credited with a new hard drive technology back in the 2000s and they got a Nobel Prize for it. They, and it always says, the two guys responsible for creating the iPod with thousands of files on it. They had nothing to do with the iPod. They never worked for a computer company. They never had anything to do with any of these things at all. Um, but all the papers always say this because they worked on magnetism and that was how the data was stored. But they didn't even create the hard drive at all. Um, so these two guys back in 1980, in the mid-1980s, had discovered this one thing that happened. You have your north and your south poles on a magnet. And if you stick them together, they repel. They'll always push each other away. You guys remember doing this as a kid, right? So they figured out if you take those two and you press them together and you glue them with an adhesive in the middle, that they will align themselves with each other. So the, they'll become parallel together. And they will no longer repel each other. They just have to wait for a period of time, however long that is, before it happens. They did it with sizable stuff. I mean, huge pieces of magnet and materials and all their tests. And they wrote these white papers about it. Well, Stuart Parkins is a physicist at uh, Palo Alto Research. And he read these papers and he saw what had happened. So he started to work on technology for IBM, uh, which is a branch or a division of IBM. He started to work on this for hard drives. How do we get past the next storage? And he basically created the exact same thing. The head of his hard drive is basically three layers. He has two poles that he glues together and adheses them. And then he puts a shield on the outside. Because as the data passes by, it causes the electrons inside the two magnets to repel and then return to each other. So the thing that the people in the white paper had discovered was when you align the two magnets, they won't repel each other anymore. But as soon as you introduce another magnetic material into it, they return to their original state. So they go crazy trying to repel each other until that magnetic force goes away and then they align each other again. So I know I've destroyed whatever technology was involved in this entire process, but this is the short story version. Um, so, so Stuart Parkins figures this out. He creates a head that's basically the same premise and now it's very sensitive. So he can write more data to a drive in a smaller amount of space and then detect when the electrons go by. And so the first magnet will repel the second magnet and they measure the resistance between the two. And so now he can see when bits are going by. But here's the other cool thing. He's, there's videos of him on YouTube doing this and talking about it and he will tell you that even though he created the heads of the hard drive that we have used since 1997-1990 that they are unreliable and that you should never store data on them. <clears throat> I'm not kidding you. <clears throat> he basically beats up his own invention at this process. He's basically like, 
I want star data on this. I am scared to star data on this medium. And he knows it. And, it's, and that, you know, that's how I feel about driving a Tesla. Like that, just like, oh, it's got solid state storage in it. Oh, it's going to drive into a tree. So I don't want to do it. But that's how he feels. That's how he feels. I, I have to be careful with that because every once in a while I get a call from Tesla. Uh, we'd like you to recover this material.